Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. All right, Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for a day to look in your word, and we pray this morning that you would use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us. Like, Lord, right, right where we're at, Lord, just meet us where we're at. Lord, encourage us. Lord, give us what we need this day so that we can be encouraged for this coming week. All the challenges, all the blessings, everything that we would face, Lord, even the, even the appointments you have for us to, to uh, reach out to others, Lord, we just pray that you use all of that. Now, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to continue what we were, the part of Scripture we were on. Paul was telling us about the comparison between two different gifts, the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues. Now which, for those that weren't with us, the kids weren't with us last week, so parents help out, which one was considered the greater gift? Tongues, speaking in tongues, which is speaking in another language without, without studying, okay? This is like cheating, I call it, 101. If you've ever learned another language the hard way at school, you know that having God, how do you let God just touch you and all of a sudden you speak fluent French or you're fluent in, in, in Greek or so. I mean, just no studying. No, you didn't have to study a bit. Just one. Anyone would volunteer for that gift? Just like out of, you know, spare yourself Rosetta Stone or, you know, one of them learning like you just like that. All of a sudden you're fluent by the gift. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It's a, it's a much much less painful way to learn a language than the way that I had to pick it up. So so I I love that gift. But which one was greater? To prophesy, which was remember prophesying is when you speak not what you think. You it always starts with with a certain saying. What is that saying? Thus saith who? The Lord. So you're not saying what you say. The best way I can describe a prophet, a true prophet of the Lord is it's similar to um, when I was a kid, we built these crystal radios. Anyone do this? You take the little science project, you make the, you get a piece of crystal and, and you wrap it with copper wire and you make a little resistor and put a current through it and hook it to a speaker and then you, then you sit there and you move it back and forth over the coil till, till finally you hope to find one, one frequency that is being broadcast on and it starts coming out of your little speaker. And once you, once you get that thing dialed, Basically, you leave the, the needle right where it is on that coil because you move it a fraction, it's like all over. you got to start again. Well, a prophet is like one of those radios that is, is literally tuned to the correct frequency that God broadcasts on. God signals broadcasting. I mean, radio waves are invisible. People say, how do you believe in a God who's invisible? I said, radio waves are invisible. We still, you know, flip on the radio every day and tune in, don't we? We even bop around different channels. But see, with the Lord, with the Lord, a true prophet is like one of those crystal radios that's just dialed to that one specific frequency. And, and it will only, that radio will only make a, an intelligible sound when the broadcast signal is being sent down. What happens if the broadcast signal stops? The little radio just sits there quiet waiting. You may hear a little hum, you know, from the, from the current going through, but it, it doesn't have any sounds to make of its own. A true prophet isn't there to say what they think. A true prophet is just tuned in, like a radio, to God's frequency. And when God broadcasts a signal, they go, um, thus says, the, the Lord is broadcasting now. He wants you to know. And they say, thus saith the Lord. That's the common intro to a prophet's speech is you're you're saying what the lord once said now last week i i mentioned to have the a friend that has a gift of prophecy would any of you like to have a friend that has this gift that they are tuned into the lord and whenever you needed to know something you're like man i need to anyone ever felt god i wish i knew what you wanted about this certain thing in my life i wish i knew the answer tell me the Honestly, raise a show of hands. Who has ever thought something like that? Where you wish you knew for, I mean, you, you, you didn't want any questions in the mind. You want to know for certain. God, I need to know, is this what you want me to do? Or is that what you want? Show me what it is. And that's a legitimate prayer. That's a great prayer. But what if you have someone in your life who's gifted with the gift of prophecy? 
And you're praying, oh God, show me, oh God, show me. Like, like the king Hezekiah, when he was seeking the Lord and, and asking the Lord. And the Lord tells the prophet, go in and tell the king. Thus says the Lord, I've heard your prayer. I, I heard your plea. And here's your answer. Now, if you have a buddy that you work with and they got this gift, and you're in the morning, you're, you're going, oh God, I need to know, I need to know. You get to work and there he is and he goes, oh, by the way, the Lord told me to tell you, thus says the Lord. You were praying about this certain thing. Should you do this or that? And he wants you to know to do this. Who here thinks that would be cool? I mean, save you a few steps of, you know, like, I'm wondering, I'm wondering. I mean, this is the beauty of having someone with this gift. The gift of prophecy is, it's, you know, those people who say that was just for back then, that's baloney. The gift of prophecy was given to the church to help build up the church until the coming again of the Lord. Christ came the first time. It's so funny to me that people say, well, when the perfect comes, the, the imperfect will be done away with, and we see dimly, and we don't... Um, and they quote this verse completely out of context and say, so the things of the Spirit aren't for today because Jesus has already come. The perfect has come that way, so we don't need the, those things of the Holy Ghost. I said, wait a minute. Excuse me, quick question here. <laughs> when was the verse written that said that? Before Jesus came or after he had come? And the answer is after. He had already come the first time, and it was saying when he comes again, once we see the Lord when he comes in his full glory, we're not going to need these gifts of the Spirit. You're not going to need me or someone else with the gift of prophecy to say, thus says the Lord, to tell you the answer, because you already got the answer. You'll be standing before the Lord with full knowledge, and you'll be like, got my questions answered. But until that day, until that day, we need the gifts of the Holy Ghost, all of them. I mean, anyone here need a gift of, at, at times in your life of healing from the Lord? Or maybe, you, you know, healing on the inside, maybe brokenhearted. You need the Lord to, you know, the Lord can mend broken hearts. This is the beauty of serving a God that is the great physician that can take care of the whole package of our being, our body, our mind, our soul. Every part of a dimension of our being, God can take care of because he created. And this, I never want to sell short the power of the Lord. Now, last week I started to tell you a testimony about the lady at our Calvary Chapel in Verde Valley who got the gift of tongues and prayed in Italian. She was all excited. And I told you I was at the prayer meeting. I was a, I was a new Christian. I got misconstrued. Someone asked me, you were a young kid when this happened? I said, no. The young kid thing was when I was in Catholic school as an altar boy, you know, studying to be an altar boy, asking questions of the nun about revelation. But the part of the story when I was... What, what was telling you about in the Verde Valley was when I was a new Christian. You know, I went to Catholic school, and this might be odd to some folks, but I learned about God as a young as a young boy. But I wasn't taught that you could know Him in a personal way. I was told you could know who He was out of respect, like like you could say, "I know who the president is." You like study, you know. The, the, the political history and politics and, and stuff. And you could, you could learn of these people. Well, that's how I learned of God. He was over there. I learned about him. But it wasn't like I lear learned um, on an intimate basis who he was. And it wouldn't be until like t till my last year of high school. I was 16. I did high school um, kind of rapidly, so I finished early. And so in my last year of high school, I came to Christ. And I was telling you the, the testimony, um, it was one of my first prayer meetings at a, as a, a church prayer meeting where they get together and they were all pouring out their hearts to the Lord about different things. And I was too because I had gone off to Bible school. I had finished high school and went off to Bible college and, and Calvary Chapel had a little, a little like, it was really cool. It was up in the San Bernardino Mountains up by Big Bear. And they had this um, retreat center and it was the Bible school. And Back then, you could not go to Bible school to get a degree. You went to Bible school to learn to get closer to God. It was not a, um, you get, you, you're going to be able to come out with a certificate, I have completed and I am accredited. It was, it's really strange. It, you just went because you wanted to learn more what this book said. 
and they had great teachers that taught us the Word of God. And it was sweet because out of that came a whole bunch of people that turned out to go into full-time ministry. In the early Calvary Chapel movement, there was a lot of guys that got their foundation studying the Word of God there. Anyway, back to Bible school. I, I, I go to Bible school. I learn about the Lord. I'm all excited. I come back to our little fellowship, and I'm, I, I'm at this first prayer meeting, and they're praying, and I go under the coffee table because the room was crowded, and, the only, and I was small, so I fit under this really low little coffee table, and I'm laying under there praying fervently, God, the pastor, uh, the, the assistant pastor, Bill Elander, who did the youth, he taught the youth at our church, he, he just told me that he's going to go to California and continue his studies. He's going to this school, Biola, Biola, something like that. It's a, a seminary over there, and ta or Talbot. I can't remember which one. It's one is the undergrad and one is the graduate. Anyway, he went to the graduate one. And so he was telling me, oh, I'm so glad you're back from Bible school. I'm leaving. I said, wait, I haven't finished learning. I just am new. I've been a Christian just for a little while. You can't leave now. And so the pastor is praying, Lord, please, um, please bring someone who can teach the, the teenagers like Bill did. And as soon as he prayed that, I'm under the table going, yeah, Lord, please bring someone to teach the kids like Bill did. And, and, and wait, wait, no, like Bill, forget that, Lord, just keep Bill here. <laughs> you know, that's so spiritual. <laughs> like, God, can we amend this situation? We got a problem here. Bill shouldn't go because I'm not done learning yet. And I still got more questions. And I'm under there, oh, God, please, just, and I literally couldn't even concentrate on any of the other prayers. People were praying about their auntie having cancer and all these problems. I didn't hear another prayer except for that lady's prayer in Italian. And, and when she prayed in Italian, you know, I'm still praying, but I'm only on one topic. I, told, I didn't tell the topic last week because I didn't want to sidetrack from the, from the importance of this gal getting the gift of tongues. For her, it was a, a life-changing experience that, that she never studied this language. She grew up in northern Arizona. She, she really wasn't what, what we would call highly educated. She didn't, she didn't make it to college or she didn't even finish high school. So all of a sudden, to be fluent in a language she never studied was a big deal. She was excited. Like, whoa, I spoke in tongues. Like, God is real. God is with me. And I was thinking, I spoke in Italian my whole life. Well, please. No, <laughs> I got a question, God. Who's going to take over for Bill? Now, every time I prayed that, guess what the Holy Spirit was doing to me under the table? Just, just take a stab. You are. Now I'm like, not me. I'm way too young. I'm like, and I'm not, I only been to Bible school for a little while. I mean, I got so much more to learn. There's just like, I'm just at the beginning of this journey. And, and, and Lord, you need to get somebody. You need to send somebody in here to take care of those kids. Because I mean, I'm part of the youth group. And, and, and I know the kids because they're my brothers and my sisters. And, and, and they're friends. And, and there's Tim McClary. And there's, you know, um, Joan Ramsey's daughter, Kristen's in the group, and, and these guys are, 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 you know, they're more on fire, they're on fire for you. They need to keep growing, and Lord, you need to bring somebody to help teach them, and Lord, who are you going to get? And the Lord's going, how about you? And I'm like, no, how about we get somebody who's been in this for a while, who knows what they're doing, and I'm still going like this, and the whole time, this is when the lady prayed in Italian, how great God was. How magnificent, the glorious, the God that has authored salvation through his only son. She gives this wonderful tongue about the Lord. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's great. That, she's right. That's good. Just get back to the, and I still haven't prayed out loud myself about the thing that the pastor had led in about Bill leaving. So my mind is still focused on that one topic. Now, why was it focused on that topic, do you think? What do you think God was working on? Me. And what do you think he was working on me about? You're the guy. You're going to teach the kids. No. I'm sure there's someone else. Have any of you ever had a feeling like God wants you to do something and you're pretty sure it's wrong? I mean, like, 
in your mind you're going uh 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 and you know in your heart you're supposed to does any does this make sense to anybody what I'm talking about this is what was going on in my head and I'm learning the pastor stopped the whole prayer meeting when that lady prayed in tongues and said hey excuse me if there's no one to interpret we have to ask you to be quiet and I'm thinking quit quit harping on the lady let's get back to the prayer time I still don't got my answer Finally, by the end of the thing, and the lady, you know, the other fellow interpreting, and then I give the confirmation, yes, that's the right thing, and how do you know, because I speak Italian. Oh, wonderful. Great. Can we, are we done? Because I thought they were going to stop, and I was like, but I didn't get my answer yet. And this is when I could have used one of them prophet guys. Like, you know, seriously. So finally, one of the guys asked me, well, what happened? Well, at the end of the prayer meeting I went up to the girl and greeted her in Italian from behind just like kind of the side she looked at me with a deer and headlight look like huh I was like you really did get the gift of tongues didn't you she had no idea what she said the Bible says when you pray in tongues that the mind is unfruitful God just uses you as a vessel just like that radio of the prophet is really not making up his own message he's just receiving it from the Lord same thing happens with tongues only it's in a different language and so she's all excited about the Lord. And I'm still in a quandary inside because that whole time under the coffee table, God's going, what, what about you? Why don't I use you? And I'm like, no. So I went up to the pastor. Excuse me, uh, pastor. His name is Ken Brewer. Um, Ken, uh, you know, you're praying about Bill is going and um, when is he going? And he goes, he's leaving Thursday. I'm like, it's Tuesday, you know? This is like, this is not good. This is like two days. Wait a minute. This is like, wh who's going to teach the youth group this week, you know? And he, he just, <laughs> so well, that's what we're praying about. And I said, all right, listen. Now, I know it sounds, this, I can't even believe I'm saying this. Because the whole time I knew God was saying you, but I didn't want to say it. So I said, if you can't find anybody, that's how spiritual I am. If you can't find anybody to cover for Bill this week, I mean, like, it like just doesn't happen, I don't know, um, then, I don't know, I, I'm not really sure, because I, I, I don't really hear much of the prayer this, today, because I was praying, and all I could think about is God was saying, you're going to do this, and, and he's smiling. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen one pastor that's mature in the Lord smile, the smile of, I already knew, and I've been waiting for you to catch up, look. Like, <laughs> and I'm like looking at him like, why are you smiling like that? And he goes, oh, I just, you know, was waiting for the Lord to tell you. And I was like, you knew? And he's like, yeah. Why didn't you tell me? If you knew, I've been agonizing under the table for the whole last hour, wondering if I, could I even possibly be thinking this is correct, that I'm supposed to teach the kids, and I'm just one of the kids, you know, in the, in the group. It's kind of weird. He goes, no, you're the right one. I go, how do you know that? Now, you know how he knew. He already, had, the Lord had already spoke to him and told him. But I'm like, so... So finally, he comes out with it. He says, the Lord already told him. I said, what the Lord already told you, why didn't you tell me? He says, because the Lord told me not to. Now, that's a really strange thing. I'm like, why? Why wouldn't the Lord tell you to tell me? He said, well, I, it's okay that I tell you now, but I had to wait until he told you first. You know, there's, he had learned this from... From Pastor John Higgins mentored him. He said, you know, because uh, I saw John, I worked with Pastor John for, for eight years. And in the eight years I worked with him, men would come to our church and they'd say, I hate working with this pastor. He never tells you what to do. He's so annoying. You know, like other pastors, they got it together. They tell you what to do. I said, that's, what's wrong with that? And he says, I said, I've been working with him for eight years. He's great to work with I'd go in the morning, hey, John, I'm here. What, what, need help with anything? Uh, I need this number. I need this, you know, whatever. Could you help me get this, someone's phone number, whatever? And I have a gift of photographic memory, so I would just write it down real fast. 
and turn it on the paper toward him so he can make his calls. You know, like, okay, there you go. Anything else? He's like, well, w w what are you going to do if, you know, like, I don't really... I said, well, if, if you don't need me, I'm going to go in the back room. we got to tear out this wall, the mop closet. We're going to open it up, make the Sunday school classroom a little bigger. And we were in an old Chuck E. Cheese pizza building. So we're constantly remodeling. We called it Chuck E. Chapel because Pastor Chuck, <laughs> we were close to Mesa, not in Ma close to Mesa. So we were in Arizona. We used to joke about this, you know. We were the Calvary Chapel close to Mesa in Chuck E. Chapel. And we, we, we were having fun with, the, the Lord was doing cool things. But John would just, he wouldn't tell me what to do. He'd say, what's the Lord telling you to do? So I would tell him, and he'd say, oh, great, go do it. And all he did for eight years was encourage me to listen to what God told me to do. And then when God told me to do it, guess what? He just said, do it. I mean, this is, you talk about good spiritual mentoring. This is the best you can get. A man who goes, I believe God's big enough to speak to you without having to have me tell you. And when he tells you, I can be there to give the confirmation, that's fine. And that's what Ken had learned that from watching John Higgins. And so instead of telling me, yeah, you're the guy, he just waits. He's waiting. I'm sweating it out, man. I'm just telling you. This is a big decision. This is a whole life different change. Gonna stop. You gotta be. I was drawing my drawings, making money, selling them out of Sun Silver West. It was a gallery in Sedona. It became La Galleria. I was doing really well in the art world. And I was like, You want me to teach kids? Or it goes, It's a start. I was like, I'm not qualified. Yes, you are. And that's when he showed me the verse. I told you my qualifications, right? God has chosen the what things of the world? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's how I got the job. He said, there's a fool. I'll use him. Everyone will know there's a God. They don't go, I wonder if there's a God. When, when the people from my high school find out I'm a pastor, they go, there's got to be a God. Izzy's a pastor in Hawaii. Give me a break. You know, there has to be a God. Did you, did, I, I would be the guy in the yearbook they vote least likely to ever be a pastor. That would be what the, you know. But that's the way the Lord works. And he was working on me. And I tell you, I wish I would have had someone with a gift of prophecy, which, by the way, I, Ken Brewer did have the gift. He just listened to the Lord and, and didn't tell me that it's the Lord's call on my life to do the kids until after the, till after who told me first? The Lord himself. And sometimes, now I know our culture doesn't like this. They like to shift the responsibility. My Catholic upbringing, we, we shifted all spiritual responsibility to the priest. You know, hey priest, could you find out something from God for us about this? We'll put a little extra in the box. It's like, like the pre <laughs> we put all the pressure on the poor priest or the nuns. You guys go get the answer from God. Come tell us the answer. Is that really spiritually correct to do? No. And let me show you how incorrect that is. In fact, today I submit to you something that's not very popular to teach, but it's right here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 14. It said, we read over it last week, verse 26 says, what then is the outcome? 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then is the outcome, Paul says? When you assemble, each one of you, you come together. One has a psalm. Another has a teaching. Another has a revelation. Another has a tongue. And another one has an interpretation of tongue. He said, let all things be done for edification, for building up each other. Now, this isn't something we practice in Western Christianity where we come together as a group, and we say, um, does anyone have a, a, a word from the Lord today for, for the church? Does anyone have a, a, a tongue or an interpretation of that tongue? You know, we don't, act in, but in other parts of the world, Chris, in Christian experience, if you travel, you might, you might come across this where they get, they come together, and, and when they assemble together, they don't have just the pastor is the one instrument speaking. They have, you know, other people have gifts. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I was just driving to church this morning. I heard Pastor um, 
uh, Mike Kessler was on the radio, and he was talking about how in the book of Acts, there was a guy named Agabus. And Agabus had a, a word of prophecy for the church that he was in, and it's recorded for us in the Bible. It says, Agabus spoke up and said that the Lord showed him there was going to be a famine in the land and that they should get ready. It sounds almost like the story, remember when Joseph in Egypt, you know, the Lord showed him, the, the, well, he didn't show Joseph the, the, the thing. Who did he show? Does anyone remember? The Pharaoh. He saw those fat cows by the river, the seven ones, right? And then seven skinny cows came and ate the fat cows. And yet they still look skinny. And he, he's like, this is perplexing because cows don't eat cows. And I don't get it. And what's the vision mean? Remember? And, and they finally, he has another vision. He, he, he's like, I'm perplexed. What does this all mean? And they, they said, well, there's a guy in your kingdom. And he's in, been in in the jail, and I don't want to mention this because you were mad at me. Uh, the chief cupbearer and the and the baker had got thrown into the prison because they upset the king. And when they were in there, they both had dreams. And Joseph said, "Well, to the baker, he said, you know, the the cupbearer said, I I had this dream and I had these grapes and I wrung them out and I put it in the king's cup and made the king his wine, you know, and gave it to him and." And Joseph says, well, that's the Lord is showing you he's going to restore you from this jail cell back to your position with the king. And the chief baker said, well, I had a dream, too, that I had a basket on my head with, with fresh baked goods, and I was going toward the king with it, and these birds came, and they pecked the, the you know, started eating the bread on the top of the basket. And he's thinking, so what's this mean? He goes, it means you're going to lose your head. Now, who can tell me in the Bible what happened? exactly what happened and so when the cup when the king had this thing about the cows the fat ones in the skin he's going i don't get this the the chief cupbearer goes i hate to bring this up because you know we're not supposed to mention things that upset you and you were a little bit mad with me and the baker you threw us in the jail but when we were in there we met this slave guy from a hebrew this um this guy and he he interpreted our dreams we and the king said go get him they cleaned him up and brought him before before the king and and he interpreted and said, the Lord's showing you, you're going to have seven fat years in your kingdom. Seven years of plenty. Followed by seven years of what? Famine. And the famine will be so severe, it will swallow up all of the good years. So it will look like there's nothing left from the good. And so, King, the Lord's showing you this so that you could get ready. You should prepare. You should, during the fat years, you should set aside some surplus so that you're prepared for the lean years. And, and the king goes, who's got enough wisdom to do such a plan like this? Who'd they pick? Joseph. Joseph. King goes, well, you're the one that seemed to have it figured out. Why don't you lead the brigade? And he goes from being in jail to being the right-hand man of the king of Pharaoh because he has an interpretation of God's plan. God gave it to him. Well, Agabus had a similar gift from the Lord, the gift of prophecy to tell the church, guys, there's famine coming, we should get ready. And they did, and because of that, the, the church was spared, you read in the book of Acts, because just somebody, they got together, and someone, ha what, if, what if we got together and someone said, I got a word from the Lord right now, I just want to, could I share? In, in Western Christianity, what would we usually do? Uh, later, or... Not, not in our, go somewhere else, you know, we're not Pentecostal. Or, I, I've heard all sorts of different lines in this. I'm like, I don't know about you, but what if, what if Dawn was the one, she was seeking the Lord for cer certain thing, and right behind her, the guy is going, uh, Steve, Steve Hunter's there, and he goes, the Lord's telling me to say he has something for somebody here. Now, he might not even know who it's for. But what if he had enough boldness to say, oh, could I sh share something from the Lord? And we let him. And she goes, oh, that was what I needed. Oh, thanks, Lord. You sp I wish someone would have just done this at the prayer meeting I was at. Like, come on, pastor. Why would you have to wait to the end and make me sweat it out? You know, why, why can't you just spare? Now, I know our church experience in, in, in our Western Christianity isn't quite so open to letting people use differing gifts. But, but in, in my early church experience, what happened was at the end of the teaching, 
the pastor said, for those of you need to go, you're free to go now. But those that want to stick around, we're going to sing some more praise songs. And we're going to ask the Lord just in case somebody does have a gift of uh, a word of encouragement or a, a word of prophecy or, or something. We're just going to have what he called it an afterglow. We're going to have an afterglow. The, the church after, after church party of the Spirit and see what God might do. And it was really interesting because God started to move and do things in those little afterglows where there were people that would stick around and they, we saw people get healed, physically healed. We saw people get healed emotionally. That was, I mean, it's one thing to get healed on the outside, but it, there's some damages on the inside some folks are carrying that I tell you is a bigger mess than, than a broken bone. You know, and, and that only the great physician can unravel some of those problems. But he can. And that's the guy I serve. He gave us the gift of his spirit so that we would be able to partake and we would all be able to use whatever gifting portion he gave us. We could use those, like Herb. Our brother Herb goes to the hospitals and prays. He's our chaplain, prays for people. And he's got a pain in his own body. And yet God uses him such an instrument of compassion and kindness to people in the... I, I meet people in the community and go, oh, your chaplain visited me while I was in the hospital. I'm like, he did? He didn't tell me. What happened? Oh, man, I was in pain. You should tell him, by the way. Um, he prayed for me. He just came in. I was kind of a little bit uh, in and out a little. I wasn't... But, but he came and there was another fella and he prayed over me and he said, and the pain just left. The doctors came in a couple hours and said, well, you look, we're going to release you. You look great. Go home. You're all well. And he goes, but I never, got to, I, I never got to really find out who the chaplain was. Only thing was the, the, the nurse told me, oh, that's the chaplain from that little church on the beach. So they came down here and found me to tell me, your chaplain, they didn't even know his name. I go, his name's Herb. Herbert, but Herb. Yeah, he prayed for me while I was in bed, sick at the hospital, and the Lord touched me. And I'm like, cool. Now, guys, is God allowed to use just Herb and me? And just Diana, who prays once in a while. And just Aaron, who prays. Oh, well, I know he prays, too. And if I look around, I know God used a lot of you. Has his hands of compassion. But see, we... We have to remember all of the gifts of the Spirit were given so we could use them to help each other. And maybe if by some chance, someday you're at church and God's putting it on your heart, there's like a certain thing you can't even, you can't ditch it, you know, like you know something. And you're like, how do I know that? And, you, and you're not sure what to do. Just pray. Say, Lord, show me. And if he says, um, well, Ask the pastor if you could share that with everybody. Or if he just tells you, turn to the person next to you. Or maybe after the service, talk to that person. Should you do it? Yeah. I would have loved it if someone would have beat Ken to the punch. Like, I mean, uh, I mean beat him by like an hour at least. When I was first going, not me, God, not me. And the Lord just had maybe some auntie on the couch go, hey, you under the coffee table. It's you. I mean, that's all it would have taken. Spared me an hour of agonizing of, God, no way. You can't use one like me. And, you know, I was really in agony about, is it a big deal to me to be the one that would teach my peers about Jesus and think, I don't know if I can handle that. that that's a, you know, there's a spiritual responsibility when you're talking about someone else's walk in Christ. I mean, I don't want to mess that up. I need to know that's, I, I need to make sure that's the Lord. And then sometimes you're going to have the same burning, something, some decision that you're facing, and you, it might not be about going into ministry as a, a youth minister or whatever. It might just be something that you're, you're making a life decision. Should you rent this place or that place, or should you marry this person or, 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 or not? Or, I mean, there are things we, we do well to have the body of Christ around us when we're facing some of these big decisions. Because God can just give to your neighbor a word of confirmation that 
you really needed to hear? How many are willing to let God speak through you if, if, if need be? If you're just, you know, he needed to use you to tell Herb, keep it up, buddy. He will anyway, but I'm just telling him to keep it up. Cause I already picked on him. No, he's... Guys, we need to be a church willing... How many people it said, when you come together, what did it say? When you assemble, each one of you, each one, th this tells me Paul knew God put his spirit in each one of the members of the church. This wasn't an exclusive club. This isn't taught today. Each one of you is given a different part of the spirit. Might be a psalm, might be a song, might be a, might be a, a, a word of revelation, a word of teaching. Might be a praise to God, a tongue in a different language. You might be pray. All those tongues are usually just magnificent praises of God. So cool when someone prays out in a real tongue to the Lord and someone interprets. Because you get to hear the magnificence of God. What a great thing to go to church and hear. How great our God is. How great our God is and how able he is to handle whatever is thrown at us this week. Especially if you're building a house like Pete and Diana. It's great to know there's a God big enough to handle the problems that you're facing. And to handle the cabinet makers that mech it up. And, and the guys that want to put the, the countertops before the, counters are, the cabinets are in right. And, you know, it's good to have a God who knows all this stuff. And he might use one of you, each one of us, it says, not s just pastors, or not just Aaron, the announcement guy, or Herb, the chaplain. Each one of us has a gift from God. You might just come and have a song on your heart. And you might just be thinking, but it's just a song. I can't ditch it. I keep singing that, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord. Great. If you got a psalm from the Lord, then that's one of the coolest things, man. It's so sweet when someone has that gift. We used to call Ron Miller, our missionary that's in Thailand, we used to call him the walking jukebox for Jesus. He used to pass through the hallway. He'd be singing one song. And he I don't know if he just didn't remember all of the chorus or whatever, but like literally he starts singing one song. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus. He'd be going down the hall. Yes, Jesus loves me. They're a grown man. And then, oh, Lord, I thank you. I really thank you. You didn't finish Jesus Loves Me. It's okay. Oh, Lord, I thank you. You know, and then, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. And he'd be like switching songs like a jukebox. Always to a different Christian praise song. The pro That guy would pass through the room. And the interesting thing I noticed was, you know, we have like men's prayer going on. He'd be passing through doing something and picking up something and singing a song to the Lord. And he'd go out of the room. And the weirdest thing would happen. You notice all these men start humming. Yes. And it was like catchy. Isn't that weird how it works? You know, you hear that tune and it gets stuck in your head. And, well, maybe God brought you to church and you're the one with the psalm. That song for the Lord. And you're just... Go, you can't shake it. I don't know why. This song keeps going through my head. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a, like a way that we did church where, where people actually each one used their gift so that the whole church was all built up? Not, not, it would, I know it would break the mold how we do it today. But I think it would be more powerful because each one of us would use whatever gift we have. And, and maybe you'd be the recipient of the gift. Maybe you just need, you need to be the one hearing that word that day. Or maybe you need the, someone to speak so that you get to hear, yeah, the Lord is with you. And yes, that is what he wants you to do. It's a sweet thing, isn't it? But if we don't leave room for it, we don't. And by the way, this is why I encourage you if, you, if you have an opportunity to come out like on Friday night where we do the, the family night for at church. We used to call it youth night, but then some of the adults start sticking around so we just they didn't want to go so we're like okay i mean god can speak to the whole group so we call it family night now if you want to come out on friday night to our house that's a great place where we can use those kind of gifts we just hang out have a meal together and let god you know maybe have a psalm or 
a word of encouragement, or maybe you just need one, and God's going to send you there so that he can speak through Herb or someone else to you, then I want to I wanna encourage us that we become a church that actually leaves room for God to do these things. And I want to encourage you today, if before you leave, you feel like you're, something's on your heart that you would want to share either with all the church or just you feel like you want to share with somebody God specifically puts on your heart, go, go talk to Diana or go talk to, 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 to Sharon or something. Don't leave here without doing it. Because that person might really need to hear that. Just like I needed that day to, to have that cheesy smile that Pastor Ken had, like, yep. Like, you knew this already. Yep. Just waiting for you to catch up. No, he didn't say it like that. I, I said that he's, <laughs> that's the look he had. Like a slow poke. But I got it. And someday you might be the one needing it too. So next week, I'm going to continue this part of Corinthians, but more into the parts of how do we use this gift of prophecy um, in today's vernacular? How do we actually let it operate? in the church and is it allowed is it allowed in our church by the way if you have a gift of prophecy do we allow you to use your gift what do you think i got a thumbs up in the back from aaron the answer is absolutely if you really have the gift now next week i'll go over some of the rules of using the gift i know rules but actually paul spells out how you're supposed to use it make sure it's um you know done in an orderly manner you don't just Bark, I got a prophecy, I got a prophecy. You know, all, everyone's prophesying at once. That's Paul's going to go over this next week. God is not a God of confusion. When it comes to using the gifts, they're done peacefully and peaceably in a way that just builds up everybody. It's a sweet thing when the gifts of the Spirit are, are actually practiced in, a, in an orderly manner that lets everybody, you know, get built up from it. And so next week I'll go over some more of that because I really do think it's been neglected in, in American churchianity, the way we're doing it today. The model we have is, is veered from the model what was delivered to the early church, where the whole church was all part of each other and they all were there to build up each other. Now we do have a loving church that builds up each other. I'm not telling you we don't. It's just there's a few of the gifts we could, we could incorporate to even make it even better and, a, and a, a deeper strengthening of one another. And maybe you're one of the ones gifted with some of those words of encouragement. So we'll go over those things next week, what Paul talks about. But I'm getting the signal enough before the rain. Let's pray. Father, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for holding back the rain. Let us get this all put away if it's okay with you. And there's a nice cool breeze and... Let us just, if you, if you have a word of encouragement, a, a psalm, a song, Lord, even right now as we're, as we're breaking down, putting things away, let those ones that are gifted with those songs just sing out to you, like Ron Miller used to do when he'd walk around, Lord, that we could all be encouraged by the touch of your Spirit. Lord, if you want to give words of prophecy or, 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 or encouragement, or gifts of healing to, to our body, Lord, when Herb's over there praying with the folks, we just pray a mighty anointing would fall for all that need your touch. That as they come over to that picnic table, they would, they would truly be touched by your spirit and they'd be healed. Or as only you can do. We look to you, Lord. Do, do your do Anyone want God's doctoring in you besides me? Raise your hand real quick. Lord, show of hands. We've got a lot of doctoring we could use. Our brother here, with his leg, we just pray right now you would just... Bring great relief and swift healing, Lord. In Jesus' name. Anyone agree with me? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.